The second largest Vietnamese population outside of Vietnam is finally getting its own American service center. How heavy rains have affected burn scar areas. Update news starts now. From the School of Journalism and Mass Communications at San Jose State University, your source for what's happening with a fresh perspective on today's issues. You're watching Update News. Welcome to Update News. I'm Sandow. And I'm Rodri Smith. Santa Clara County is home to the second largest population of Vietnamese outside of Vietnam. But a study a decade ago found the language and the cultural barriers kept them from getting the services the county offered. Finally, now a new community site hopes to change that. Darwin Seculayan has the story. This new center is the only one of its kind in the country, and it's been nearly a decade in the making. After years of planning, the Vietnamese American Service Center just opened this week. The $65 million center sits in the middle of San Jose's Little Saigon district. And um, I'm first generation, so I'm a proud daughter of Vietnamese immigrants, and so then this is just really special to me. And um, I'm also like pursuing a career in healthcare, and so seeing the intersection of these two fields um, is just really rewarding. And I just think this will have like a really amazing impact on the Vietnamese community. It will offer medical, dental, nutritional, mental health services, and childcare all under one brand new roof. The center that will serve its community, and the residents won't have to travel far. It targets residents like Nô Nôi, who have lived here for more than 30 years. I'm very glad because I have a place to come here for meet my friend, meet my social worker, and meet our professional people. The new Vietnamese American Service Center is a 37,000 square foot building built to cater to the Vietnamese population here in San Jose. Patients will receive health and other wellness services without the barrier of language or distance. The building was designed with Vietnamese culture in mind. Designer Thang Do intended the structure to be a centerpiece of the community for generations to come. Uh, I hope that, uh, that the building speaks not only to older generations of Vietnamese like myself, but also to the younger ones. And they can come to this building and they can find aspects of Vietnamese culture and history. And while the vast center was created with the Vietnamese population in mind, it's open to anyone in need of its services. In San Jose, Doreen Saiki Lion, Update News. California has been hit with big storms called atmospheric rivers. What are they and why are they happening and will they make a difference in our drought? Joshua Gilman has a story. What made this week's storm so especially powerful was what's known as an atmospheric river. You can think of it as a boost in subtropical moisture, sometimes streaming away from central Hawaii and the central Pacific up into the west coast. This boosts rain totals to the point of flooding, and it also provides more energy for developing storms, making them stronger with more wind in addition to the increase in rain. Sunday's storm was rated at near the highest for atmospheric river moisture with some areas in the North Bay Mountains seeing more than a foot of rain in just 24 hours. And if you're wondering if this helped the drought at all, not too much, just a slight alleviation. We still got a long way to go, so everyone please continue to conserve water. Although this event did help extinguish the wildfire season quicker than last year, especially for Northern California. Thanks guys, I'll see you later with the weather report. And when we come back, Coming up, how to stay safe during Halloween celebrations, right after this.
We are one step closer to getting a COVID-19 vaccine approved for younger children. This week, the advisory panel to the Food and Drug Administration recommended emergency use authorization for Pfizer vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. The dosage will be about a third of the adult's vaccine. It will be given in two shots, three weeks apart. The FDA is expected to accept the recommendations of outside advisories. If that happens, the Centers of Disease Control and Prevention would give the green light as early as next week. Santa Clara County health officials announced that they are already preparing to get younger children vaccinated. The CDC says study shows the younger children really need to get vaccinated. The CDC wants you to be safe this Halloween. Although more people are getting vaccinated and COVID-19 cases are decreasing, they're still recommending that you take some precautions. Here are some tips to help keep your trick-or-treating safe. First, consider handing, handing out individually wrapped pieces of candy directly to each children. That's safer than letting them grab from a single bowl. Then look, at a, look for a get together where everyone is vaccinated. The unvaccinated are still at high risk of contracting COVID and passing it to younger children. If you're planning on an indoor celebration, make sure you keep fresh air circulating. Keep some windows and doors open and remember that masks that are part of your Halloween costume aren't designed to protect you from the spread of COVID. The Bay Area is rebounding after the first bad storm of the season. Some people who live in the Santa Cruz Mountains have been warned they might need to evacuate because of the burn scares. That land damage after the recent wildfires is more vulnerable to mudslides and flooding. The scorched land has little vegetation and less able to absorb the water. Um, do we feel safe? No. <laughs> Um, there was, it was the biggest storm that we've seen in all of our time living there. And what was really kind of, I guess, worrying was the, um, the possibility of a debris slide really doing some damage, you know? They have dodged a bullet this time, but California is being hit with these big storms fueled by the atmospheric rivers. But coming this weekend, we can expect lighter showers in the area. Josh Gilman has the weather report. After our record-breaking storm to start the week, we'll see a few more chances for rain ahead, but nothing like we just went through. Next chance for showers comes on Saturday, with rain arriving again into Monday. Now, looking at the extended outlook, we see that some of the clouds and shower will trickle in over the weekend, not really too much activity, but getting into Monday afternoon to Monday evening, we'll see a lot of that main green and shower activity heading to the Bay Area. Looking at precipitation predictions, there's gonna be pretty trace amounts throughout the Bay Area, no more than a tenth of an inch through the weekend, but as we head into Monday, that's when things amp up a little bit and precip totals will be about a third of an inch to half an inch. Now, going into our seven day forecasts, starting in Santa Cruz, they're going to be having uh, some slight chance of showers on Saturday with most of that shower event uh, taking place on Monday. Probably cloudy skies on Sunday and highs in the upper 60s. San Francisco is very similar to Santa Cruz with most of the shower activity on Monday. Highs will be in the mid 60s and lows are looking like consistent in the mid 50s. Oakland is going to be seeing some shower activity on Saturday and more activity on Monday with more cloud cover. Highs will be in the upper 60s, lows again in the mid 50s. Finally, in San Jose, the rain will uh, once again begin to trickle in on Saturday. Don't really expect anything much, but once again, maybe about a third of an inch on Monday, with highs going into the lower 70s by late next week and lows consistent in the mid 60s. All right, that's a seven day forecast for the Bay Area for you this week. Joshua Gilman, Update News. And when we come back, what it's like to be a student broadcast journalist. And when we come back, we'll have a rundown for this week's sports. More to come after the break. At San Jose State University, we discover who we want to be. For ourselves, for our families, for our communities. Different and unexpected. Begin here. At the heart of a transforming valley in a city that is tough and beautiful, we are Spartans. What powers us? changes our world.
Ever thought about being a sports broadcaster, following your favorite team, calling games? Might seem glamorous, but it takes a lot of hard work to get there. And for some, that preparation starts while they are still students. Jonathan Schaefer shows us the side you rarely see and talks to a student who is trying to juggle it all and winning. Thanks, Rodri. I traveled with San Jose State broadcaster Ryan Carlson last weekend to get a glimpse of the work he does to pursue his dreams. Here at Snoopy's Home Ice, two hours from campus, San Jose State Hockey faced off against Santa Rosa Junior College for a late night game. But broadcaster Ryan Carlson shows up hours early to set up all of his equipment and get a feel for the rink. Checking his camera and audio are up to speed, supplied by Black Dog Hockey, a growing hockey streaming network Ryan works for. Well, once the dream of playing hockey professionally kind of drifted, I, I wanted to stay around the sport in some ways. And then I thought of the broadcasters, and, and I thought that would be a cool thing to pursue since my grandpa did broadcasting back in his college days. Well, it's gotten hectic at times over the course of my college career. From freshman year, I was uh, hired with the Sharks and wanted to get involved with San Jose State Hockey, make sure I was on top of all my schoolwork also, and, and then also prepping and um, preparing for those broadcasts. And, uh, you know, you didn't get a lot of sleep. Sometimes there would be class and, and a broadcast on, on a Thursday, and that night you you hit the road and and um, take an overnight bus with the hockey team to a to a road trip and, and broadcast a couple games on the road, and then you're back on Monday. All of this preparation is the hard part of every broadcast, but it is all worth it when he gets Our a moment a like man. this. Spielman down the left in front, go! The stretch pass from all the way in his defensive zone. Fulmar saw it the whole time. Ryan Carlson will continue to broadcast for San Jose State Hockey unless he's working his other job with the San Jose Sharks. In San Jose, I'm Jonathan Schaefer, Update News. And this is what happened last week in sports. Women's volleyball extended their win streak to three after a crucial win against Air Force in three sets to move up to 13-7 and 7-3 and and in the Mountain West. Latahivai Lucy finished with 12 kills and Haley Nelson had 10. Men's soccer has not seen a loss in six straight after defeating University of Incarnate Word 1-0. They continue to climb up the West Coast Conference standings with a record of 6-1-1. Women's soccer never broke the ice against San Diego State University as they tied in a double overtime. Freshman Taylor Phillips currently leads the team with 12 points in 18 games. The football team has kept its bowl hopes alive after a huge 27-20 win against the University of Nevada Las Vegas. Now at 4-4 and 2-2 and in the Mountain West, the team will look to get its first win streak of the season against Wyoming. Men's golf placed third in their final tournament of the fall season at the Stockton Pacific Invitational. The team will not see the course again until late January at the Southwestern Invitational. The men's water polo team went 5-0 in the Julian Frazier Memorial Tournament and are now over 500 for the first time in this season at 14-12. Men's ice hockey lost the series against Santa Rosa College, tying the first game and losing the second in overtime. Now they have a crucial six-game slate against all Pac-8 teams still seeking its first win. And now we have State of the Spartans. This week we spoke to students about their classes and their time both online and in person. So it's been a little bit more difficult because I'm this whole COVID uh, pandemic being all online has been kind of difficult for me because uh, I'm more of a hands-on learner. So being in class would actually be a little bit easier for me to understand the material, especially when you're learning a bunch of new things in economics right now, I'm learning a lot of new stuff. So I like having the hybrid classes, but I just wish that it was more in class rather than just like one class a week. It could be two classes a week because it sort of gives you a more personal time with the teacher. So if you have questions, you can ask them right then. I would say not ideal because uh, some people learn definitely learn better, especially me uh, in person. And um, when it comes to like online stuff, you know, sometimes I'm at home. I'm like, nah, I don't want to. I don't want to open up my laptop. I don't want to open up my computer. You know, 
and uh, I don't even want to try my webcam sometimes. You know, I, don't, I look like I look terrible waking up sometimes, right? So, I think they're dealing with it the best they can. I mean, uh, it's kind of new territory, I guess, for everybody. So, uh, just trying to be safe, keeping our distance, making sure you know they have the sanitization stations inside the each building. So that's pretty nice. Um, and they're providing masks and whatnot, uh, making sure everybody's vaccinated on campus. Uh, so I feel like they're taking uh, good steps to ensure that everybody on campus is safe. I would say when it comes to class sizes, they are doing an okay job. I think they could do a little bit more, uh, much better when it comes to like class sizes and social distancing. Because I know that there are a, a few, a number of people here who don't like follow those social con social distancing and because of that since we do have like a lot of students in one small classroom it can get a little bit packed and it can get a little bit difficult to try to maintain like social distancing and like safety standards and i feel like the school is handling hybrid and in-person classes very well i do think that they are actually doing a really good job especially since this is a new event that hasn't happened for basically over 100 years and that this is a pandemic that has cost many lives, that has cost many um, students to have mental health problems, basically has called global problems that will most likely change our world. But I do think that the faculty is handling um, the COVID-19 pandemic um, response on campus well. Now, a look at the week ahead. All Hallows Eve is here in just a few days on October 31st, and to help celebrate, Japantown is hosting a Halloween party. This event will take place on Jackson Street between 4th and 6th, during 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. Lunar Network West will have a Dia de los Muertos event on November 1st at Park de Pobladores located at Sofa District downtown. This celebration will run from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Come explore the streets of San Jose like never before. An event called Viva Calle, San Jose will be temporarily shutting down miles of streets to allow people to walk, bike, skate, and play. It will also feature activity hubs, live art, BMX specialist performances, and food trucks. This event is on November 7th from 10 a.m. to 3 p.m. <laughs> and that does it for this week's edition of Update News. From all of us here, thank you for joining us and see you next week.